I mentioned in the first video in the series when we were setting everything up that I was going to change a few things and you can see here what I've done differently with the outline of the hair. This bit here I've eliminated completely and smoothed it out to make the flow a little bit better. This was my main area of concern. I just didn't like the way this was working at all. It looked like a claw. So I just went back and sort of faked something in here. But you can also see that I'm adding some details to sell the edges, that it has some wispiness to it. We don't want the hair outline to be perfect. We want some irregularity, but we need to design it in such a way that it looks good. Designed randomness, if that makes sense. Here's how I add edge details to the outline of the hair. It's actually the same technique we've discussed in video number two when doing the lashes. We've got the pen tool active, we have the brushes palette open, and we've selected what is basically an eyelash brush. We draw several curves, then assign a brush shape to them. If we go into the outline view, we don't see any stroke width, which means they're still editable. If you want to convert these to shapes, we go to Object, Expand Appearance. They're now more difficult to edit, but it does allow us to use the Pathfinder to make them part of the overall hair base shape. This makes it easier to change colors and put a black outline around the edges of the hair. If there isn't enough edge detail, the hair outline will look stiff and lifeless. If edge details are added carelessly, instead of adding interesting detail, they wind up being an unnecessary distraction. A couple of things to keep in mind when considering the hair. Number one, hair has volume, it's not flat. So when we render it, we need to render the highlights, we need to render the shadows, and areas like this to really create the sense of dimensionality. These are almost like waves on the ocean, rather than just being flat surfaces with lines on them. A common mistake for students to make is to look at the photo and say, okay, I see here that there are lines that go all the way down from the top to the bottom, therefore I have to draw them that way. Usually, that's going to be a mistake. Another common problem is to get lost in the details, to see all these different strands of hair and be overwhelmed by them, and feel like you have to draw them all. To be successful with this, you need to learn to see the big picture, but not all the details. To see that this is a form all of its own with highlights and shadows, that's distinct from this form, which is reacting to the light in its own way. You want to suggest the character of the hair, but you don't want to try and do that by drawing every single strand. Hair color is pretty much a trial and error thing. What I do is start with a base overall color, then I look at the highlights and shadows and pick colors that are lighter or darker versions of the base color. I'm usually limiting myself to three or four colors. For this particular illustration, I went through at least five different color combinations before finding a set I was happy with. There's not a formula to it. The colors do interact with one another, so you need to see them together. You may very well have drawn all the shadows and highlights and assigned colors to them, and then decide it isn't quite right, and you have to go back and make further changes. That's a normal part of the process. Drawing these long, spiky shapes with the pen tool accomplishes several things. They help to establish the direction the hair is flowing, they suggest hair texture, and they help to create transitions between the lights and darks. Having the dark brown going up and the light brown going down helps the two colors to mix. To get transitions side to side, we can come in with more of this color and add it next to the larger shape. This will soften the edge where the base color and the highlight colors meet. You can also do the same thing with the shadow areas. If we wanted a transition area in here, we add another small highlight shape on top of the larger shadow shape. Beginning with the top of the hair and moving down to the bottom, I'm going to let the video run for the next few minutes without much commentary. You'll see an enlarged view of the highlights and shadows slowly appear next to the reference photo. Feel free to stop the video at any point to compare the photo to my illustrator interpretation. With something like the eyes, the steps to getting a good result are pretty straightforward and obvious once you know what to do. Not so with the hair. Learning to successfully translate photo hair into illustrator hair takes lots of practice and you may not like your results until you get more experience. This took me about four hours to do 
and yes, it can get tedious, but resist the temptation to cut corners. Well-rendered hair will really set your work apart from other vector artists. Let me show you one more little trick. I'm not going to use it for this illustration, but if the hair you're trying to replicate has a shine from being very highly brushed, you can make a shape roughly like this, filling it up with whatever color works best, then applying a very large Gaussian blur. This looks good, but it's probably a little too bright. Of course, by now you should know we can knock it down with the transparency palette. We can even play around with some of the blend modes to see if we can get a nice interaction on top of the already created highlights. You can add shine pretty much wherever there's a highlight. It doesn't have to be yellow. It can be white or even light blue for black hair. Sometimes this trick will add just that extra little something something to make the hair look really great. I'd like to finish our time together by showing you some examples of self-portraits created by students in my Digital Graphics 2 classes. One of the many things I love about teaching at Palm Beach Atlantic is that I get to work with some truly talented artists and designers. In my experience, most students coming out of other schools don't really know the pen tool as well as they think they do. I've had conversations with hiring managers at ad agencies and design firms who will have applicants tell them that their Illustrator or Photoshop skills are 9 on a scale of 10. When these claims are tested with a practical exam, it turns out that the skill level is closer to a 2 than a 9. If you do a self-portrait well, nothing proves better to a potential employer that you really know your way around Illustrator. They make great additions to your portfolio. If you're looking for more learning resources, I highly recommend the Illustrator Wow Books by Sharon Stewart, available from Peach Pit Press. If video learning is more your style, it's hard to go wrong with a subscription to lynda.com, and lynda spelled with a Y. They're not as generous as I am in that they don't share much of their vast collection of how-to videos for free, but the breadth of knowledge in the area of graphic arts software is amazing and well worth the money. I welcome any questions or comments you may have. I don't claim to know everything about Illustrator, but what I do know, I'm happy to share. Thanks so much for watching.